Welcome to the Embodiment Podcast. This show is for you if you see the body is more than a brain taxi. It's for people interested in coming home to the body as a holistic aspect of who we are and how we live. Episodes contain practical tips, exercises you can take away, and interviews with specialists from around the world. I'm your host for today, Maud Haber. Welcome in this episode of the Embodiment Podcast. I am Maud Haber, your host, and today I am delighted to be joined not by one, but by two great interviewees. Welcome, Kendra Charles and Francis Tabin. It's great to have you on board today. Thank you. We're so happy to be here. Yes, great. Calling from Bali. And we will have a beautiful conversation today on the interface of acro yoga, trust, connection, and all the life skills that can be applied off the yoga mat and that derive from the practice of acrobatics, acro yoga, slacklining, and more. And so I'm really curious about this conversation and Kendra and Francis, you bring a lot as a background um, in this space. You have certifications as yoga teachers, Ayurveda educators. You practice partner acrobatics together. Um, you are acro mastermind coaches and you founded Acro Couple. You will say more in a few minutes about Acro Couple. And you basically help people um, gain self-confidence in their life while connecting with each other in and through the body and connecting beyond that to the earth. Uh, and you have a lot of emphasis on joy in the practice, and I hope that you will share more about that joy, inclusiveness, and access of the practice so that we can go beyond uh, just the technicality of acro yoga. I know you, you work internationally, you are a kind of nomads, and you offer retreats, uh, in-person trainings. You also venture on the field of online embodiment teaching, which I'm really curious about. And uh, although you live and you practice mostly in Asia, I know you're present worldwide, and you also um, participate in publications such as the Elephant Journal, a variety of uh, yoga publications and festivals. And you live in Bali with your pack of foster puppies. They haven't been invited for this interview, um, but you are both uh, most welcome. Thank you for accepting this invitation. Did I forget anything about you both? No. 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 <laughs> Great. So I'll start with a question that is ritual that we love to ask our interviewees. What does embodiment mean to you? And you don't have to agree on that. You can start. To me, embodiment is first connecting with yourself, with your physical body, with your breath, and then going even beyond that, embodying and connecting to others in relationships, as well as connecting to the earth. So there's so many layers and a web of sort to me when it comes to embodiment. Mm -hmm. Francis, yeah, anything you'd say differently? Well, uh, it, it's the same framework, and this is why we agreed on that. Um, but to me, it starts with, uh, with, with identity, like knowing uh, who you are, and that's defined by your relationship, it's your connection to yourself, your connection to your environment, which is to, to the earth and nature, and also uh, your connection definitely to others, because uh, like you can be anything you want if you're by yourself you know uh, but it changes when you bring someone else in and so we it, it has to be part of embodying your identity your your what what you decide to be uh part of it has to be how you are when others are around so that's why we pick those three like uh, connection to self to others and to the earth to our environment mm. Thank you. Um, so you founded Acro Couple. Would you like to say a few words around uh, what Acro Couple is and what its purpose and mission in the world is? So uh, Acro Couple, um, <clears throat> I know it sounds like a, a couple that does acro, but uh, we really, <laughs> we really wanted to to uh, put more into it. We're saying uh, couple in terms of connection. 
So, um, what in our practice of acro, uh, acrobatics, you know, we always have this, uh, kind of sweet spot that we get where things are easy, but we are able to do like amazing things, but we're not fighting, we're not struggling. So we're trying to, uh, that's what we're trying to share is, um, a practice that will develop people's connection so that it's, it's in a place where everyone's healthy, safe, and happy, but uh, everyone's also able to do amazing things, you know, get to places where they don't necessarily think they can go or things that are just impossible uh, alone. So that's really the, the core value for us and using this, this practice. Mm-hmm. What is unique about the intersection of acro yoga uh, acrobatics and the context of the couple? Um, I'm sorry, could you repeat that? What to you is really the unique mix between the practice of acro yoga, which can be practiced between friends or even strangers, and the specific context of the couple that you two bring to the practice? Uh, do you have anything to say? Well, We've been practicing as a couple for almost eight years, and it's really taught us tools to be able to navigate our relationship, whether it's celebrating something or disagreeing on something, but it's really allowed us to be able to communicate and listen and work together. Mm-hmm. Beautiful. <laughs> Could you say a little bit more about your backgrounds, maybe both of you and uh, specifically maybe, yeah, what your background as a couple and as practitioners has been until you founded Acro Couple? Yeah, so um, I, I'm, I grew up like mostly uh, uh, studying towards math and engineering, a very, very scientific approach. And that's how my mind has been molded. But all the time I was also um, writing and playing music. And then um, so all the while there's that creative aspect, like a creative robot is a nice way to describe it. But uh, uh, when we met, uh, that that kind of clashed with Kendra, who was more of a, uh, I let her describe how she, <laughs> she <laughs> Interesting. What happened? Uh, so... Um, you know, she's very organized and, uh, she loved to schedule stuff, uh, in, in particular with the practice of acro, uh, it would be like, uh, I would be focused on what should be happening, like, happening mechanically or what should be moving, what the forces should be going to, things like that. And she'd be like, what? No. How should it feel? Like, I want to feel what it moves like. I want, it should feel nice and smooth, you know, and I'm, Kind of just like did this. Aha. Uh-huh. Uh, That's so, different uh, ways it, of processing the information, even if deciding in the moment between the two of you. So. Yeah. And it's very, uh, what's interesting is uh, when we met, we were already both a little further in the practice. So we were able to do uh, pretty uh, intermediate stuff. So when we started playing together, we were like, this should be easy, right? You know? <laughs> but uh, I mean, it wasn't. <laughs> Could you say more about what what specifically happens when even as a seasoned acro yoga practitioner, you meet a new partner, uh, whether it's a romantic partner or just a new practice partner, and you discover this unique blend? What, what happens? What are the challenges? What are the opportunities at this moment? One of the things that we always look for first is what are the strengths the person brings? Because we believe everyone has a strength that they bring. And we explore that and become curious about that first and foremost. And that's our starting point is discovering that and working with that. And when it comes to challenges, we find that it's a lot of different things that come up for people. So we actually like use each other to help support it. And we might do that. Um, in my case, I have experienced a lot of fear in the practice and emotions in the practice. And Francis hasn't. 
<laughs> really experienced that at all. So he'll ask me to come in in that case and provide support in that aspect. Mm -hmm, great. If, if that's fine, I'd love to ask you about your own um, story of the first, maybe the first weeks, months and years of your practice together. And um, if I understood you well, your practice was first as, you know, um, yoga practitioners and, and then it turned into a, a romantic relationship. And I, if I, I heard from you explaining that trust has been um, the subject of quite deep experiences for you and that you had at some point to overcome some real issues around trust within your partnership on the yoga uh, mat in the grass. Uh, and that also may have showed up in the relationship. Would you like to say a little bit more about that? Uh, yeah, uh, uh, so we met at an at a acro camp, actually. It's like a little camp out. Uh, three day camp and we were in a, in a class at, where, uh, the, the move was quite precarious and I was, uh, spotting. So uh, for those who don't know, a spotter is, uh, like a safety person, like an extra person to make sure that nobody gets hurt. Uh, and long story short, uh, she got dropped on her head when I was the spotter. So that's like a, a huge, uh, uh, thing, uh, and, uh, uh, let her say what, what was the result of that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I got a concussion from it. And to be fair, the way that the trick fell, we weren't coached in that way to spot for the, during the class, but I had really lost trust in him. And every time that he would work with me, I would be like shaking in fear and not wanting to do anything beyond super basic poses. Mm. So we basically had to start from scratch, mm. forget everything that we knew and start over from the beginning and build the practice as if we were beginners to build that trust. Kendra, you mentioned you had to learn um, around how to work together again. What did that entail specifically in terms of, of the balance of offering and receiving support and, and of the trust dynamics? What really, what did you put in place? What supported you? And I have a sense that these are skills that you're able to teach others because of that deep story, isn't it? One of the most powerful things for me when starting over was being able to voice how we were feeling in whatever we were doing. So for example, if we were doing something where I felt nervous, I would say, Francis, I really need some more support here. I'm feeling scared. What can we do to make this feel better for us as a partnership? And sometimes that was going to the beginning of whatever that pose is and getting really comfortable and confident there. Sometimes it was saying something like, I've got you. And those words really make such a difference. So that was what was most powerful for me. Mm. So expressing feelings, expressing needs, making requests, expressing support. So really making the implicit explicit. Is that one of the ingredients? Yeah. Uh De definitely communication was huge uh and uh, the practice of acro to me it's like uh the rawest form of uh, of relating you know <laughs> when you talk about a relationship there's so many factors complexities uh issues that can come up but when you're doing acro it's usually you know what you want to do and you can break it down to small so you could start somewhere where it makes it very easy to find out what you need and then as a, as a result, find out how to communicate that and as the other person, find out how to receive that or even better, how to help with that. You know, oh, that's actually my strength. I'll share some stability with you or, you know, like uh, I'm super confident with myself so I'd be like, I have you. Just uh, trust me for now for this first step and then we'll, we just keep moving forward. And I, I think uh, 
that's one important part of the practice uh, of, of playing acro that really uh, helps uh, with this kind of thing. And for you specifically, Francis, in the role of bass uh, in support of Kendra, what did you learn most from those um, weeks of months of recreating the, the trust and the connection? Well, uh, <coughs> the, the biggest lesson is that um, assumptions are dangerous. You know, like <laughs> uh, every time uh, it's a different person you work with, it changes pretty much everything. You know, the the basic concepts are the same, but, you know, just because, oh, she's advanced, I'm advanced, we're going to be advanced. Like, no, not at all. Uh, it actually got in the way of uh, figuring out what really we had to do, how we had to do things. Because we, we needed to find out what we were, what we had, what we had to work with uh, in order to uh, achieve what we, what we set out to do. And uh, as a base, you know, and, and, and it's common, actually, especially when you're, you're really strong and you can do many things. Uh, it's easy to just like, oh, I can do that with you. I can do that with you. But um, it's, it takes a certain skill to actually uh, be able to help the other person do it so that they can do it with anyone and not just you, you know, because I could, if I was strong enough, I can throw anyone up, make them do anything. But once I'm gone, they don't have anything. They don't take away anything from it. But uh, if, if you can be that person that um, looks at it, as a relationship and that as me basing you, it's us working together, uh, then you can start seeing everything that changes every time that the partnership, the partnership changes or the partner changes or even the environment changes. Like, uh, the assumptions just need to be, um, I don't know, tempered because <laughs> yeah. there's definitely lessons to be learned from, uh, from, experience and that's where usually where assumptions come from mm -hmm. but i think it's part of being present uh understanding these changes mm. thank you both for both of you for, for already outlining in everything you've mentioned here how uh, the body mind dimension is uh, and distinguished in, in all of this work and i'm really curious around um how you see the relationship between the practice of acro yoga of acrobatics together as a partnership as two people in a partnership and the rest of life so how would you say that the skills and the capabilities developed in acro yoga can be transferred into life skills and what skills are they mostly go ahead as i mentioned before communication is definitely a huge piece of it. Um, we, we kind of joke that you can tell how a couple will navigate their relationship in life by how they work together in an acro practice. Um, and we, we don't have any hard evidence or anything, but we feel from our observations, couples that we've seen that can harmoniously work together, even if there's conflict, they have a very solid relationship on the mat and off the mat. How does that look like on the mat? Like if you have to give three, four observable elements that you would see that give a sense of, aha, yes. Uh, yeah, I could, I could probably write a case study about that if I wanted to, but um, there's a lot. So, so first of all, there's a, I mean, I wrote an article. It was on, on a website. It's called My Weighing. And if you see that in acro, it's mostly, uh, the flyer or the base just bossing the other person around, telling them what to do all the time. Uh, and, um, sometimes it works. Sometimes, uh, the other person really is just a follower and it works for them. But most of the time it, it, ends up in some sort of, of abuse of power or misunderstanding or misconception. And usually when I see that uh, dominate a, a partnership it, on the mat, I would be like, I don't think they'll last uh, longer, you know? Uh, and then usually after a couple of weeks or a month, I'd be like, oh yeah, there's 
they're separated. Uh, and it's happened more than I'd like to. <laughs> uh, I, I prefer to be wrong, but uh, I've been right most of the time. Mm. Uh, Have you seen uh, some of those um, challenging moments on the mat turn into real learnings and just like in your story moments where suddenly there were insights and maybe there was a, a shift to another paradigm in the relationship have you witnessed that yeah can you give an example there are some students that are a couple of ours and one of the partners went into it very scared that she would get dropped on her face um, in learning the practice and When they learned, he was very, the, the other partner was very supportive in sense of, okay, well, let's get some extra support here. Like maybe let's have someone spot more really closely or some more hands on, or I'm pretty tall. I can sit in a chair and make it lower. So you're not so far off the ground and it's not so scary for you. And so it's really, I think, offering different support and being calm and really listening to what the other may need and what you can offer. So that whole giving and receiving. Um, but I do believe there's, I see, I think a sense of calmness and quietness and presence about couples that are able to um, stay connected to each other and work through those things. And and for my example, it's really simple. Um, we do this thing called a counterbalance, where basically both of you are hanging off of each other in a precarious balance. Uh, so I was teaching this to to a couple, they're a married couple, and um, uh, she was very uh, vocal. That's like this is scary, this is scary, and uh, he was not saying much. Uh, But uh, you could tell that he was very like focused and determined to not let anything happen. Um, so uh, I just suggested, it's like, you know, when she says she's scared, tell her that you won't ever let her go, you know. And he did that and it actually succeeded, which is, you know, great to see. It's like, oh, you know, I've never let you go. No, I'm never letting you go. I'm never letting you fall. And, you know, it went up and you can see, uh, you know, you can talk about the love languages, but they've found uh, how, you know, someone expressing their fear, but the other person also learned how to share their support and their, or their courage, their confidence. And those are the things really that, that um, apply towards life. You know, uh, if you can do that, in the basic, you know, like I said, like acro to me, it's just like basic. It's like, you don't, you're not being asked to do anything complicated. It's just this. And then you can work on all those skills that I, I believe uh, bleed through to your life because it has an hour. Mm -hmm. Thank you. What, how would you describe specifically, and just as you said, apart from the technicality, apart from the acrobatics of it, what happens specifically in your experience when two partners synchronize their movement and their breath? So much. So much happens. The primary, uh, the best part of which is that things get so much easier when things, when it's as synchronized when we're both working together when we're both doing uh, our job or fulfilling our role uh, things that may look uh, impossible when you saw a picture or uh, they they look not only they feel not only easy but usually they look so much better as well and uh, we're we're still trying to to find that in our our real life of like being you know uh so in sync and so uh so uh we call it calibrated in acro you know calibrated to each other uh so that th the things we're trying to do would become you know so much easier and uh almost comfortable 
So you both have, in your partnership in Acro Yoga, um, roles that are mostly defined of Francis mostly, most of the time, uh, playing the bass and Kendra most of the time flying. But you mentioned that this is something that can, can change. Um, what can the positions of bass and flyer be metaphors for uh, in the rest of life? Kendra, maybe. Yes. Well, when I think of a bass, they're the ones typically laying on the ground or their feet planted on the ground. So to me, they're the earth and providing really stable environment for the flyer who's up in the air defying gravity. So to me, it's a base is like the tree, the earth, the flyer is the sky or the wind um, and moving, but, or even the leaves of the tree as we, as it moves, but you have that, those roots um, that keep you stable and grounded. I like to think of flyer as the person like dancing on the feet <laughs> of the base, um, a place of expression. Mm, lovely. So you bring in the four elements in your work. Is that an ingredient of, that you work with, with couples or partners? Yes. The aspect of nature and the earth and, con and connecting with it is a strong part of our practice and very relatable to us as well. Okay. And I think to others. <laughs> And does that entail switching roles from time to time to gain also that empathy of, aha, I didn't see that, but that may be the challenges you're having in carrying me or in flying over me? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, uh, like, um, and uh, it actually it's nicely connected to your question earlier of uh, <coughs> what, what the base and flyer are. To me, it's really a question or an issue of uh, who has uh, the most to offer uh, for the particular situation. So uh, if my strength is that I am strong, then yes, I will be the one lifting you up in the air. Uh, and because physically, that's just how it is with the two of us. I'm the stronger one between the two of us. Then usually I am the base. But um, when, when you translate it to, to life, you know, you don't always, you, you can base if you have what it takes to be the base, you know. And like she said, it's like the solid foundation. You know? The earth is always the most solid foundation. That's why we always come back to the importance of connecting to the earth. The ground will always support you. But you have to kind of uh, bring the energy and strength of the ground to the flyer. So it's the same thing. If you have something that you could share with someone in order for them to thrive, for them to heal, for them to achieve something they thought was impossible, then you can definitely be the bait. Be the one that's connected to the super solid earth. Give your strength towards the flyer so they can dance up there in the air, do make something beautiful together and you know, really just reach literally and figuratively Uh, new height. Great, thank you. I think um, I read that um, you have worked in the corporate context, in the context of the world of work. Uh, what may be the applications of the Acro Yoga partnership in terms of learning to collaborate, learning to trust, to co design at work? What have you learned around that? I have a background of over 13 years in higher education. And a lot of the work I did was with student affairs. And I found that actually a big part was the joy and the fun that makes up part of acro yoga. And it just brought a lot more lightness to the workplace and a collaborative spirit that was inspiring. And it also gives a chance to um, not be so in silos and more connected to each other to work towards something bigger than yourself um, by applying those aspects of listening and communication and connection. And it's really fun to do in the workplace. I've actually tried it previously with some of my coworkers and even the students. Um, and it was just really fun to 
joined together to do something that pushed our edges and to see what was possible and to do it together. Mm, great. Uh, one of the reasons I was asking is also listening to Francis earlier, I was reminded of, I think it was this um, Harvard Business Review article around the dynamics of teams and collaboration and how uh, you can take 17 PhDs and put them in a room and have them have the dumbest conversation ever. So in other words, um, a little bit as you mentioned before, you can take two super seasoned acro yoga practitioners, put them together, and that can be a major fall, uh, which you have to catch up for in six months of, <laughs> of hard work. So how would you say this may apply to teamworks? Well, uh, it goes back to, uh, um, what do you call this, the calibration part. So calibrating with each other so that we can really work in the best possible way uh, with the um, most efficiency, with the, le the least amount of conflict. Um, that's definitely a lesson in acro because we can definitely fight each other trying to do something, you know, and not just fight like words, like, you know, I'm pushing, they're pushing, or not getting into the right position. Uh, and everyone's working way too hard and someone might get hurt eventually in there. So it's this calibration of, uh, you know, maybe we don't need all these PhDs, you know, maybe we just need the two people and half and half, you know, <laughs> and it makes a really good whole. So I think as far as teamwork, that's like the biggest takeaway in acro, like, you know, knowing what your role is, and what you have to do and really doing the best in that role makes a really good whole package or a team. Mm. It's interesting. Listening to you, I have a sense that um, there's a lot that happens between the partners that has to do with discovery and curiosity and that lives a little bit in the space between knowing and not knowing. So, so Francis, you mentioned there has to be certain roles and clarity around that and also oh gosh you may discover something about your partner that you didn't know they were able to do so how do you hold that polarity when you work with partners i think it starts with, with the with the always with the basic thing the basic thing is there's not much room for uh, there's not a lot of wiggle room because they're so simple and the outcome is very predictable uh, and that's where you start you know like when the Superman pose, you know, like airplane pose and someone's just on someone's feet. You know, there's not a lot that you could tweak about that. Like, you know, if the base can straighten their legs and the flyer can keep their shape, that's it. But as you, you know, you make it, you calibrate it really well in that position and then you bring it up into something else. That's when the, the intricacies come up. That's when the, uh, tendencies come out the, the habits bad or good that's when they come out and that's where you kind of start playing like oh should i be stronger should i uh assert myself more or should i give room to you know uh like a biggest example i hate it at when i first practiced i hated when someone would tell me i just want to feel this i just want to know how this feels i'm like this is ridiculous you don't need to know how it feels you need to know how to do it <laughs> uh, but then you know then i'm just cranky and i don't want to play with them anymore uh, and it yeah it cut the the word the relationship it's done you know but uh i'd be like okay so i know i can do it so maybe i can work a little bit more so they can feel it and then after that we can find that sweet spot middle ground and uh that's that's usually how it how it's applied in the practice, you know, and, uh, it's, it's actually honestly one of the more difficult aspects of the practice, especially, uh, you know, like when we came together, we both like, this is how it is. Like, no, this is how it is. Uh, I, I don't know. Assumptions or stubbornness uh, definitely gets in the way. <laughs> <laughs> I know a lot of your work is focused on connection and intimacy. Um, and so I'm really curious around how you support um, people working with you closely. I know you work with small groups as well because you really value uh, a lot of that. 
close uh, observation and contact. So how do you work with disconnection when it happens in the, in the partnership work? How do you support um, issues or challenges that have to do with intimacy or contact? And how do you help people work with and through that so they can learn and grow? Well, to me, the number one way back into connecting to yourself or to someone else is through the physical body, um, being very aware of what's happening in the physical body. So it could be something as simple as taking it way back, a skill, for example, where you have a lot of success as a partnership and gain confidence within that partnership and then taking a step forward again. Um, or even coming back to the breath is another thing that really works for us. It's learning to sync that breath, the inhale and the exhale. And it's really interesting when it's not, you're each just doing your own thing, right? And you kind of forget about the other person. And that's when the disconnect happens and emotions start to escalate or fears start to escalate. Um, so just coming back to the breath, coming back to the physical body in a way that's able to connect you as a partnership once again. Mm, beautiful. Um, anything you wanted to add, Francis? Um, just, uh, yeah, I guess uh, just to add to that, like, um, you know, uh, a lot of being intimate, uh, I think a lot of fear that comes, that hinders that is actually uh, that fear of the unknown, like fear of what the other is thinking, feeling, experiencing. That's usually a huge bar barrier to intimacy. Either it's assumed they feel this way, so I'm going to act this way, or you know, and again, it goes back to that assumption thing that how bad it is if you really want to ha have a genuine connection. So what she said of like really taking it back to something so simple that you cannot assume anything. Like you just really be there, feel what it is, usually touch and, and then again, make it more complex, more deeper, uh, bring out those fears and those tendencies and then address them as they come up, you know, and we, we definitely try to make room for that. We try to make sure everyone uh, is comfortable with what we're trying. Uh, they have the support that they need. And, you know, like uh, if they need to talk, uh, it, it's so interesting because, you know, some issues come up that we don't even expect, you know, like, oh, it's a body issue, actually. And they don't want to talk about it when anyone else is around. Uh, but it's we address it by giving an adjustment like, oh, you can actually do this and you still get success. And it, you know, that brings a little shift. Uh, it's up to the person how they want to handle it. But we. We definitely, like Kendra said, uh, want to give them as much success because the success brings the, you know, it, it inspires people to do it that way. It's like, oh, it, the change gave me success, you know, and I'm happy that I was able to do this. So, so now I'm going to probably try and do that more. So the process is shared, uh, whether it's help from the partner or just something we said, an adjustment, uh, that's how we make sure everyone has it. No. Thank you. Inclusivity and access um, are important in your practice and the way you offer uh, your, your teachings. What does that specifically mean to you in terms of um, maybe who you would accept to work with, um, how you would uh, structure your learning to really offer those fundamental learnings to the most people? around you so uh me personally like uh, <coughs> the way i i make the teaching inclusive is by uh teaching conceptually and not uh not in like this uh checklist structure of like you just put this here and you just do this push here no it's more of i want people to understand what's happening the the weight is going here you're trying to support this way and it doesn't have to be uh, one specific certain way as long as the concept is done, then you will find success. Because uh, one of the biggest issues 
in acro to me, that I could see is that people are are kind of pigeonholed depending on their body type or or uh, or fitness or shape, you know, and uh, and a lot of the 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 expert professional teachers are either circus performers that have trained forever or they're physically like uh, advantaged as far as being a base or a flyer. So a really long, strong base or like small uh, gymnast flyer, you know, and uh, they don't necessarily see the issues that someone that is not that size or shape, uh, they don't see that. So they don't necessarily teach to it. You know, I've definitely had students that do something a way a bigger person would do something or do something a small person and they, it just doesn't work and they get frustrated and it's like no no this is actually the concept try and make this happen and it should be fine you know and i've definitely seen people want to stop doing it because they just can't do it how the teacher is saying so as far as we're you know that's also why we switch because i want to really do the technique <laughs> As far as flying, you know, I fly. I'm like, oh my god, this is so hard. And uh, you know, Kenza uh, bases me as well, you know, and it's difficult for her. But I feel that uh, technique-wise, it really helps us to not only improve our own technique, but be able to share it to as much people as we can. Thank you. Kendra, I know that some of the specific practices you bring as well into the world is the work is connecting to oneself um, by working with oneself on a slack line and applying that slack line yoga. Um, what have you learned in, as an embodied practice in, in this field? A slack lining is probably the number one practice I've ever done that really keeps me honest in terms of being present. If your mind wanders somewhere else, usually fall right off the line. <laughs> it's not very uh, forgiving in that sense. It keeps you really aware. Um, and it's been very transformational for me in terms of focus and commitment and being able to connect to myself as well as the earth because there's times where you might be slacklining over water or you might be slacklining and it's a windy day and you feel the line shaking. So it's learning how to stay centered and work with the elements to dance between the line and you and nature. Um, and it's, it's just a really beautiful practice for exploring what's possible on a one inch piece of webbing. Mm, beautiful. So Francis, do you have a practice in your life that is individual and that you may be using to prepare yourself as a base or that may have no relationship whatsoever to your role as a base? Um, well, uh, I, I, I do have a yoga practice, uh, but not like a regular practice, but there's a, I took a, a training with uh, my teachers in Chicago. It's called the, the Turbo Dog Yoga. And they just taught me a bunch of, uh, like, there's a couple of really good, uh, uh, I don't know what to call it, methods or, or, uh, rituals as far as, uh, dealing with, uh, with issues. <clears throat> and I use that actually very much in my life and also in acro, you know, just when emotional stuff comes in, like, uh, I don't know if you've heard of uh, the Sedona method um, and uh, uh, rewiring uh, a lot of energetic stuff, you know, uh, just so that I can, uh, you know, as a as a base, you know, I could use them if I need to be steady or if I'm afraid. If you're afraid, your flyer will be afraid because they will feel it, you know. Uh, I also mainly uh, as a very logical thinker you know i uh, i always like to exercise my 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 thinking i mean kendra will tell you i always i'm always thinking about everything all the time and, and that's really i don't know if it's a practice or not but uh 
I like to understand everything, you know. Like we go to a jam where it's acro play, and I would just be sitting there, and Ken would be like, "What are you doing?" <laughs> I was like, "Oh, I'm watching," you know, mm. like learning from everything, and uh, I feel like uh, I do that quite a lot actually, and uh, I also like uh, just expression, and it comes out in acro too. I like. I love to make stuff up, you know. I, I, I'm even saying, like, as far as the acrobatic practice is concerned, uh, I learn new stuff so I can make new stuff, and that's really uh, one of my biggest. Uh, again, I don't, I wouldn't call it a practice. It's more of just how I am. Um, mm. I, I learn so I can uh, innovate. I guess. It's beautiful. <clears throat> So further than each of you, um, how does that apply? So having an individual practice on your side and also then practicing together, how is that maybe a mix that you may also be bringing into your work when you, when you teach people? Um, do you also have a way of supporting them through individual practices and paired practices that supports deepest embodied learning? Yeah, I mean, definitely. Uh it's like all three aspects are important, the connection to self, to others, and to nature. So we always like to encourage really uh, the respect and connection to nature because ultimately that's where we get everything from, um, nutrition, energy, and support. Uh, so we're still working on strengthening that connection ourselves, you know, by... Uh, spending more time nature learning about uh, nature more and then also sharing our individual practices uh i always like to share those practices when i feel like they're relevant you know and i'm sure kenda does as well um and uh, it's more of like i guess as as needed uh, basis because again when we when we work with someone it's more of like getting to know and then you know, I don't want to be shoving all this stuff to you and maybe you don't need it. But then when we get to know each other more and it's like, oh, I think actually I have something that might help or that might be very valuable to you. And then, yeah, like anything we can share is uh, we're willing to, to give. Yeah. Thank you. I know both of you are cooking up interesting projects to share your work, not only in person, but also sharing it online. And um, I'm curious, what are some of the possibilities and some of the challenges that you're experiencing with as you venture into uh, sharing acro, acro yoga online? Yeah, we're really excited to expand people's experience of acro yoga online. And there's a lot of people that live in communities where they don't have a teacher accessible to them um, either at their level or at all and or they don't have the resources to travel or don't want to create more of um, a footprint on the earth so i think there's a lot of options in that sense and also in for collaborating amongst um, different practitioners to share really exciting things. Um, for challenges, we do hear a lot of people say, oh, you can't learn acro yoga online. Um, maybe because of the way that it's been presented in the past, in the sense of it's so technical, um, that's where it comes from, the teachings. And, and I think it's also because that's just how it's been is people have always learned in person. So I think if it's, if there is a way to, to provide a supportive environment for people in terms of content and also in setting them up for success um, in terms of a spotter, a base, a flyer. Um, and not everyone has the luxury either of having a spotter available to them, which can also be a setback, but there are ways to still practice without a spotter available. Um, so there's, I think, so many opportunities and exciting options that are out there for acro yoga online. 
Hmm. And if I hear you well, it is you you believe it's possible to offer the same levels of safety um, in the teaching online? I think for the higher level hmm. pieces, um, you do need the proper safety apparatuses, mats, lines, spots. Um, and I do think that safety has to be really emphasized if it is an online um, teaching that people are exploring, because I've heard so many stories of people being like, I'm trying to learn acro yoga from a YouTube video, and I was crashed into a wall face first. <laughs> so, like, that's not really a great way to start, but I think that can be prevented with mm -hmm. the proper knowledge and tools to keep yourself safe. Mm, beautiful. Is there anything in particular that you are preparing, secret projects, superpowers, you're developing anything else you're passionate about sharing in the world? Uh, yeah, actually, it's a, it's a project that was started by, by Kendra, and I am very excited about it. It's uh, like um, I, I did write another article before that was saying uh, I, I'm not doing acro yoga to become an acrobat. And uh, it, it it got co quite uh, shared before, but what it made me think like, oh, why am I doing acro yoga? And uh, <clears throat> and now it's like we've actually developed you know a, a practice, a way of practicing acro yoga and learning acro yoga that uh, is similar to how you know how yoga is not just stretching anymore; uh, it's developing awareness and uh, all this other thing uh, so we we're developing a series that uh, can be practiced in a very similar manner you will still learn uh, the acrobatic moves but the goal really is to be able to work well synchronize calibrate with your partner whoever you're working with and also get all those benefits of, of uh, of really having a good relation, a good couple, that being a good acro couple, and that's not just a romantic couple, any any couple, you know, that be your friend or your enemy that you're trying to be friend. But uh, that's very exciting for me, something that uh, I'm uh, excited to share. We're working out the logistics on really how to teach it or share it uh, the best way so that it really uh, bring what we intend for it to bring. It's beautiful. Um, maybe two more questions uh, to you first. What may be um, like a frontier, a a topic that you are still working together and maybe struggling with or playing with as a partnership uh, in your acro yoga in your life uh, that you'd like to share because it may inspire others. Oh, me? <laughs> so uh, struggle-wise, uh, one thing is, um, uh, and it's it's been there the whole time, I think, is uh, has still something to do with um, being so rigid. And I'm like this very liquid, flexible uh, in terms of goals and, and uh, planning, you know, like Kenya gets uh, really upset when we set something and uh, it doesn't happen and I'm always like uh, well we're still going towards that goal but we have to adjust this and that and this and that and uh, we're always still getting into you know a little bit of conflict about that and and to me personally I try to to look into our actual practice to, to see how we could uh, kind of uh, make that better you know like oh how come in, in acro we, we don't really you know have this conflict we kind of agree on on how to approach this thing or how to get to this goal so i'm kind of looking into that and still working on how to apply it in in real life mm -hmm. it's beautiful thank you for this vulnerable sharing my sense is that vulnerability may be a key ingredient of, of your work isn't it uh, oh yes uh, it's it's like the the yin and yang like there's trust 
there's always vulnerability mm. on the other side. And what may be a key message that you would have to practitioners internationally listening to this podcast, um, inspired by your experience and by what you're still continuing to learn? I'm going to ask Kendra to this one. Yeah, to me, it's the idea of connection. And that connection really allows for so much more vision and collaboration and contribution um, to our relationships and to others and really the big picture of making it a better world for us all to live in. Hmm. Thank you. Any final world from you, Francis? Yeah, uh, that's really the message. Like, uh, if if you want to try Akiro Yoga or or uh, have any interest, definitely uh, try it. You know, it's like it's very old thing. Two heads are, are better than one. It's just so true in anything that you want to do. Like, uh, you'll be surprised uh, at what you can do. Not just in Akiro, like uh, what you can accomplish when when you actually have a good connection to someone like it's just it, it will amaze you so definitely uh, pr uh work on that if not through acro through any other practice that cultivates connection like you know like really embody your relationship and not just as with yourself like you embody how you want your relationship to be your connections to be and if they're great it, everything else will be great mm. Thank you very much for to both of you for bringing the whole of yourself in this conversation, for bringing your story, for sharing uh, your learnings, your expertise, and also your doubts, what you don't know, what you're exploring, um, what you struggle with. Um, found that really inspiring um, to get to know more about your work. Uh, your website is a, a major source. I know you have some of your articles and blog posts there. So that's uh, acrocouple.com. Very simple. Um, and would you be happy to share some of the articles as a link below, below the podcast as well? Uh, yes, definitely. Yes. Wonderful. So thank you so much for bringing the wisdom of partnership on and off the mat into this conversation. More to be shared within the podcast around other partnership practices and body practices around dance, um, tango and other practices as well. All the best to you, Kendra and Francis. See you somewhere in Bali or somewhere else in the world or online. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you for your participation. Some ways to uh, get more, to give back, and to get more involved now. So um, the biggest request I have would be to share the podcast with your friends, people that you think would really enjoy it, um, email it to them, put it on your social media, tell them about it, old school. Um, yeah, really appreciate that. Equally, if you want to support us financially, you can go to Patreon, that's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash embodiment podcast, and give us a dollar an episode. And I'd say they're well worth a dollar. So um, that's less than a pound if you're in UK-ish. So yeah, please go there. Um, on the embodyfacilitator.com website is where this is hosted. If you're, most people I think listen to for iTunes, um, iTunes, we'd certainly appreciate a review. The way iTunes works means that a review means more people will find it. iTunes regards it as more important for searches. So even a couple of sentences review really does help as a little thank you to us. And if you want to go to embodyfacilitator.com, you can see the actual you know links to the sites, his comments on there um the facebook group tends to be where people discuss things so if you go to uh, put in the embodiment podcast into facebook there's a page which is relatively quiet and a group which does have some discussion on so um yeah i will reply to things personally there so um also on embodiedfacilitator.com website uh, there's all sorts of freebies there there's videos there's free ebooks there's ebooks you can buy and of course, is our newsletter list. If you want to stay in touch and learn about things like the Embodied Facilitator course and our, um, you know, our next Embodied Yoga Principles teacher training, then go to that website and you'll see a little pop up and you can um, get the newsletter through there. OK, so I think they're the main ones. Tell your friends, pay us some money on Patreon, give us a review on iTunes 
uh, send us your email if you want to be on the newsletter list and get involved on the Facebook there. Oof, bit long. Uh, pick whatever you like that works for you. Until next time, welcome home to the body.